Hi everyone, it's Christy. About two weeks ago, I made a video called, Is Feminism Still Needed in the West? There were quite a lot of responses to that video, and at the end of it, I had said that I would evaluate people's evidence and arguments. And after two weeks, that feels like enough time to have let the conversation kind of continue and the comments have died down. And with that time passed, I thought it would be good to make a video where I evaluate the comments that were left. And that's what I'm going to do in this video. I'm going to be presenting the results of a very basic discourse analysis that I did on the comments. I'm going to evaluate the responses by category, then look at two people who actually tried to answer it directly, if not adequately, at least they made a, a sincere effort. And I'm going to explain why it doesn't, it's not very convincing in terms of the evidence. I will then show an example of how I would have answered the question if it was framed in terms of in which nation in the world has feminism been most successful. And then finally, Noel Plum had left a series of comments and I want to address them directly. In the first category of non-responses by theme, and non-responses I'm defining as those answers that made no effort to address the questions that were posed in the Is Feminism Still Needed in the West video, and instead tried to change the subject to something else. A few people accused me of using weasel words in this video. That is, can be, it's a, I can control for that, for the fact that I, I made a video about the use of weasel words directed at, in particular, sort of anti-feminist content that I've seen. And people were trying to be clever and saying that I was using weasel words in this video. The fact is that asking a question can't be the use of weasel words because weasel words are only used in statements. So the definition from dictionary.com of weasel words are words, or this is a word, it should be words, used to temper the forthrightness of a statement, a word that makes one's views equivocal, misleading, or confusing. I'm going to compare a definition, part of a definition for a statement and a question. The statement we can think about as being a meaningful declarative sentence that is either true or false. If we want to say, laws about tying up your horses inside city limits are no longer a problem in the 21st century, I can verify that as either a true or false statement by seeing whether or not legislation is still being passed because there are problems with people tying up their horses within city limits. You know, so a statement, again, in this case, I'm thinking of in terms of a sentence that is either true or false. In comparison, a question is a linguistic expression used to make a request for information. So if I'm asking for information, I can't be using weasel words in order to temper the forthrightness of a statement. See how that works? Another non-response was to demand that I define equality. Now, in my videos, when I do define concepts, such as patriarchy, people in the comments want to debate the definition, not the content of the video. And I've had this happen several times. To avoid this, I decided to let people bring their own definitions in, whatever sourced way they wanted to do that. And when I did that, I had several people objecting to the fact that I hadn't predefined the structure of equality. So it really just proves that with anti-feminists, or at least a lot of them in the comment sections of my videos, they're going to criticize you or me, whatever I do, in order to avoid engaging with the substance. And so um, even when you try to give people the power to define terms to the most advantageous they can, they still complain, which I find ridiculous. <laughs> Another assertion that was given in the comments is that I had the burden of proof in the video. Now, in terms of the burden of proof, that can be defined as when two parties are in a discussion and one asserts a claim that the other disputes, the one who asserts has a burden of proof to justify or substantiate that claim. The phrasing of the question in my video was very deliberate. The statement was, feminism is no longer needed in the West. The video went on to say, if you said no, please answer the simple questions. If you notice, feminism is no longer needed. It implies that it was at one time needed and then stopped being needed. And really what I'm trying to get people to identify here is what is the precise time frame, date, year that feminism became unnecessary and how do you know? Now, to unpack this idea more, because people throw around phrases like the West without really being specific, I wanted to know what 
people had in mind. Then, how had you come to the conclusion that women, that feminism was no longer needed in the West? And what sources? Like, what? No, don't just say, oh, I saw a study somewhere. You have to be able to, uh, you know, say what that is. And then, if you have that. Um, the West is being seven countries, well, then you have seven times when equality was achieved and how that, uh, that achievement took place. That was what was being asked for in the video. So I'm not making any assertions about the state of feminism. It was designed to be a question to allow people to respond and defend their proposition that feminism is no longer needed in the West with perfect clarity as to what they meant by West, what measures they were using, and then how women achieved equality in each of those countries and when it happened. It really didn't seem like that big of a deal. Another tactic of non-response is to answer my question with another question. I have noticed that tactic being used especially by creationists, but fundamentalists in general. And about over a year ago now, I think I did a video called When Fundies, Fundies Lose Debates, They Attack, Distract, and Evade. And I classified answering a question with another question as an evasion tactic. Occasionally, people will say, I don't know what you mean by X, can you please expand so I can answer your question more accurately. But a lot of people will keep asking questions as a way to draw out the person who posed the first question and then wait for them to say something and attack their statement in order to distract from answering the question that was previously or initially posed. And I don't fall for that. If someone asks me a series of questions without having first answered my questions, I will just restate my question. And if they continue to avoid it, then I know that they're, they don't have an answer to my question. Several people just gave very glib answers as a form of non-response that saying women have achieved equality in the West and it's or feminism has never been needed in the West or anything like that without providing any sources, providing no other links. And as we all know from Hitchens Razor, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. If you don't have the evidence to back up your claim, that's fine, but then don't make it. If you can't explain how you came to that conclusion, then don't expect anyone to believe you. Another tactic that was found in the comments is just to throw random facts in without actually defining what nations were the West, defining what why this fact was a measure of equality, or what year it happened. For instance, uh, many people pointed to the idea that women's college entry has now surpassed men's in terms of percentage of, of a sex ratio in attendance or starting up in universities. But without context as to why that's a form of equality, I'm not, I don't find that just random piece of information very convincing, especially when you think about the fact that, at least in America, in my home state of Wisconsin, only 30% of college, um, only 30% of people who graduated from high school went on to university. And so at any given time, the proportion of women and men in college is not the biggest part of the population. So how do you determine that equality has been achieved for all women in the United States because some women are now entering college at an equal or higher rate than men? You see the gap there. Moving on to attempts to answer the question in a serious way. And I've just taken them verbatim rather doing, than doing the screenshots because in the next slide, I'll be doing my responses on screen as well. So this person said, uh, no, feminism is no longer needed in the West. They said the US, Canada, and Great Britain, to name a few, were the countries on their list. The fact that there are no systemic oppression laws, and they achieved equality when the Equal Pay Acts were passed decades ago. Here is my a problem with this attempted response. First, why Canada, the US, and Great Britain, to name a few? I mean, if it's there's more than those, then shouldn't you name them? I mean, that's the point of having the list. And I, and I don't see any criteria here as to why these countries are the West, other than that they're English speaking. So generally, I don't find your definition of the West theoretically consistent, or it just seems arbitrary to me. The fact that there are no systemic oppression laws, Hitchens Razor, um, you know, uh, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. If you want to make that assertion, then demonstrate to me how there are no systemic oppression laws. Don't just make an assertion and then expect me to take it on, take it on faith. Third, they achieved equality when the Equal Pay Acts were passed. Now, of course, any empirical assertion like this 
says what you're saying here is that when the equal pay laws were passed in each country, feminism was no longer needed. Well, if feminism was no longer needed, then there should be no more legislation after that date because equality has been achieved. And yet in all three countries that you list, to name a few, there is still legislation going on. There are still efforts to redress gender equality. In the United States, we've had the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization debate and being passed in, at the federal level. In Canada, Trudeau appointed the first gender-balanced cabinet in Canada's history in last year. And in the UK, there is still a tampon tax where women are being taxed on a basic necessity that you can't really find an equivalent for in terms of penalizing men. There's no razor tax for facial hair on men the way that there's a tampon tax for women. If feminism was no longer needed in the West, then these kinds of political actions wouldn't be necessary. And on that ground, I find your ideas unconvincing. The second person said that they weren't going to list every country, they're going to stick to the US. They didn't know what I meant by the term metrics, um, which I guess I must have looked it up. I mean, you, you can ask questions rather than just making things up because I you would have given better answers if you would have just asked what I meant by a metric. So using basic laws and human rights that are unsighted, the right to vote, equal pay and equal opportunity. And in particular, the date that women in the US became um, no longer, you know, the feminism was no longer needed for women, was on June 4th, 1919, because, oh, I'm sorry, when the constitutional amendment to allow women to vote was passed in 1920. Feminism in the United States hasn't been necessary since the 1920s. My response to the not listing of every country in the world is like, well, okay, you can say it's a case study, you'll look at one, but it doesn't really answer the question of the West. So when people talk about the West generally, if you just say, I'm going to stick to my country because I know it, then you can't really then say feminism is no longer needed in the West. In terms of the metrics, all of these, well, the first one is a civil right, a right to vote. The second one is a single, is a legal protection against pay discrimination. But I have no idea what the person means by equality of opportunity or how that equality of opportunity is enforced or measured. And with the last one about saying that feminism has no longer been needed since 1920, if feminism was no longer needed, why have we had all this legislation since? As an example that this is not a very difficult question to answer, I'm going to reframe it in a way that I could answer it where the burden of proof is on me and I'm going to be clear with my metrics and clear with my methods and I'm going to be clear with how I came to my conclusion. And maybe once I've done it, people will try again and give better answers. The GII is an inequality index that measures gender inequalities with regard to three aspects of human development, reproductive health, and for that they use maternal mortality rates and adolescent birth rates, empowerment measured by the proportion of parliamentary seats occupied by females, and the proportion of adult females aged 25 and older with at least some secondary education. Finally, they look at economic status, and that's expressed as labor market participation measured by labor force participation rates of men and women in the population aged 15 years and older. When the data is collected and analyzed, first place was Norway, then second Australia, and third Switzerland for 2014. The gender empowerment measure is produced by the United Nations Development Program, and it attempts to measure gender inequality across the globe using estimates of women's relative economic income, participation in high-paying positions with economic power, and access to professions in parliamentary positions. It, it was introduced at the, say, at the same time as the Gender-Related Development Index, but measures topics like empowerment that weren't covered in that index. According to this index, Iceland came in first, Norway came in second, and Australia came in third in the most recent report. The last metric I want to cite is from the Global Gender Gap Index featured in the 2015 World Economic Forum's report, and it ranks over 140 economies according to how well they've been leveraging their female talent pool based on economic, educational, health-based, and political indicators. The study's been going on since 20, sorry, 2006, so it's going on for 10 years now. According to the most recent report, Iceland ranks first, Norway comes second, Finland comes third. And in those three countries, they have closed over 80% of the gender gap. In which nation has feminism been most successful? 
Well, I would say that Norway was the only nation to appear in the top three on all three metrics. Therefore, I would conclude that there is evidence to support the assertion that Norway is the nation in which feminists have been the most successful. If, for instance, you wanted to argue that Iceland came in first in two of these metrics, therefore they should have been considered the nation in which feminism was most successful, I would say that would be a pretty good argument, um, and reasonable people can disagree when they have evidence to back it up. Finally, Noel Plum left an extended comment on the video. I'm not going to read it out here, but I will summarize it and respond to the highlights or the, the main points that he made in the comment. Firstly, to quote from him, people are incapable of agreeing as to what equality even involves. Well, clearly people are capable of doing that because I've just shown you three studies that have been going on, one for at least 10 years, where people have been doing, at least defining equality in some way, measuring it and tracking it. And again, reasonable people can disagree, but just because something is hard doesn't mean you don't do it. In the social sciences, we deal with a lot of concepts that aren't easy to measure, but we don't throw up our hands and say, oh, can't be done. We get off our butts and we get out there and we do it. The next point that I'm just going to summarize is that he was saying there's a fundamental difference between being equal and being the same. Well, that's quite a non sequitur to the question, is feminism still needed in the West and listing what countries are in the West and the metrics and sources, so I'm not going to get off on a non sequitur tangent. Third, your thinking must be so fucking flat to even come up with such an absurd series of statements, overall equality could include a balance of inequalities and variation in outcome that are anything but easy to assess. Yeah, well, the problem is that you didn't bother to research the idea of measuring gender equality to see what the metrics are, to see what their strengths and weaknesses were, before you started typing your statement. So whose thinking is so fucking flat here? The rest of the comment is blah, 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 off-topic stuff, and my response to that is... <sighs> That's going to wrap it up for me. I am sure that there will be lots of interesting comments in response to this video, but I want to thank you for your time and attention, and all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I'll see you soon. Bye.